Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Case for Genesis class. We are getting close to the end of this particular class, and um, we just have, I think, probably two more um, sessions if I'm if I'm planning it out right, although sometimes I'm known to be off a little bit on the timing. So we're going to do a part four this week of session six. And so session six has been a really um, long session because it's dealing with the flood. And I think we, we probably could have a year long class just on that topic because there's so much to it. And um, but I hope with some of the references and things that I'm giving you that if you want to go deeper um, into the um, into the science, into the into the the Bible, you know, and, and the language that's used and what the Bible says and then how um, the science supports that, not the other way around. Uh, I think that's an important thing thing for us, us Christians to do. And so, again, therefore, the purpose of of these case four classes is I think building um, our confidence in what we read in scripture. And um, again, God has given us so much evidence. Um, he didn't need to do that. We could just be required to have faith period, um, which we should. But for those of you that are like me and have that skeptical bone that we want to see how it lines up with, um, you know, science, it, it lines up very well, contrary to what, um, many in the secular world would like us to believe. And so having said that, I would love to just go ahead and dive in into tonight's um, topic, but let me, let me go ahead and open us in prayer. Father God, thank you for this opportunity and this time that you've given us to just get together and um, study your, your word and look at the evidence um, that's all around us that you've made it plain as your word says, you've made it so plain that we are without excuse. And so um, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all you've done for us and all you will do for us each and every day. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you did on that cross for us. Um, we will be forever grateful for that. Um, not truly understanding the depths of what, what has happened there, but knowing that the love that you have for us is, is great. And so we take comfort in the fact that um, you did what you had to do so that we would have an eternal home to look forward to and that hope of resurrection um, with you. And so we thank you, Lord God, for everything. And we ask that the Holy Spirit be the teacher and the guide as we study these things and lead us into all truth as, as we know that you can. And we pray all things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you for that. Um, let me share my screen. And again, like I said, I think we're going to have probably probably two more classes, give or take, and then we will move into another class because this is going to be an ongoing thing. And our next class is, is going to be a case for the Old Testament as we continue on through Genesis and look at some things um, after Noah and the flood. And so hopefully you'll stick around and, and join us for that class as well. Um, so again, I we're in part four. Part three last week was the recommendation to watch um, the video. I didn't post a presentation, but last week was to watch the Is Genesis History video documentary, which I think was about an hour and a half long. And so hopefully you got to do that because that is such a well-rounded documentary. And if you follow them, is Genesis History, you can follow them on YouTube and other places, I believe. And they are constantly adding in new material all the time. And so I think it's an excellent resource and reference source to, to go deeper because they not only present um, the fact that, biblically speaking, the flood happened according to God's word, but also um, what experts in the field of the various sciences have to say about it as well and i think i think that's really important especially to those again that are that are wanting some um science-based um cooperation maybe is what i what i want to say so or yeah yeah cooperating evidence cooperating evidence okay so that i think really helps a lot to hear the perspective from different people who are experts in different areas of of science that help 
confirm and 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 support what the Bible teaches. And so I think if you didn't get to see that, go back and take a look at is Genesis history. You can also just look it up on YouTube yourself. And so as we do each week, um, I want you to take a few minutes and prayer is important, especially if you're doing this with a small group. Um, take a few minutes, hit pause and and do some prayer, prayer cards, and then do a review. One of the things that we review every single week is to review and recite the 12 points to the Bible's big picture, um, five from the Old Testament, seven in the New Testament, which is something I think is a great tool to have in terms of being able to kind of quickly tell somebody the story of the Bible and the purpose of everything. You know, and if you can't remember anything else, just just say, you know, everything points to Jesus. The whole thing is about Jesus. And that's really the the bottom line. That's that's the thematic purpose. But I think looking at those 12 points that we pre presented back in session two, if you've been following us all along, you should have those maybe written down somewhere where you're reviewing them, you know, each week at least. And so review that. And then anything you want to share with the people in your small group, what are some things you remember and can share um, from Is Genesis History if you got a chance to watch it? So Go ahead and, and pause and do that. And then as you come back, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to now get started with this week's presentation. And so, as I said, we're in session six still, which is on the topic of the flood, um, part four. And I'll give you a little overview for what we're going to look at um, this week. And number one, we're going to look at what are the problems with secular dating methods? Um, number two, what is the geological column of time? And that's what that picture is is showing you. Um, you've probably seen something like that in the textbooks or on TV or on, at a museum or something to that effect. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then everyone has the question when we're talking about Genesis and we're talking about creation and origins and all those things, what about the dinosaurs? And so we'll, we'll take a few minutes to, to hopefully answer the basics of that question that a lot of Christians have, because Again, what, what we're going to do this week is we're going to look at the things that are pretty much um, embedded in secular academia when it comes to science, when it comes to um, geology and the teaching of that, that particular science. There's a lot of assumptions that are made that go along hand in hand with evolutionary theory. And we're going to look a little bit at that that history there? Um, and what are some of the problems with the secular dating methods? Because there are problems. And I think what, what a lot of Christians wrestle with when it comes down to it, once you begin studying the Bible, is the idea of, you know, the, what the Bible teaches in Genesis about God creating in six literal days, and then the world over time is growing evil and more evil, and God decides to, to just wipe it out um, and basically start over with Noah. And we, we get that story. And, and it's important that we know that the Bible is a historical narrative. And so what the Bible teaches us is history. Now, how do we rectify or reconcile that history with what modern day science teaches in the classroom, in academia? And so that is where the problem in it is. And if you remember... I've really been trying to make the emphasis about the paradigms, the paradigms that are in secular academia today, in the science curriculums, in the world of geology, in the world of biology, um, in the world of cos cosmology, just science in general, um, has, the, uh, has the paradigm that the earth is old. And so we'll look at where that paradigm come from and is it possible that they're wrong? And I would submit it's very possible that they're wrong. And we'll look at some of the reasons why. Um, and again, if you have questions, I mean, this is something I really encourage Christians to, to look into and at least have in your back pocket what, what the argument is all about. Is this a salvational issue? No, it is not. The salvational issue is giving your life and commitment that you make to Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And that's not a works-based mentality. So maybe I should rephrase that a little bit. Jesus took on the sins of 
all of us on that cross. He paid the penalty that we each one individually deserve to pay because before a holy God, we cannot stand with any sin within us. And so the idea that I'm a good person, God should take me, you know, because I am a good person. It, we really have to think through that because, you know, it's that whole thing of if you've committed one sin in your life, you're worthy of the punishment. And regardless of what that sin is, it's like it's like a person going before the judge and saying, I only committed one murder, judge. You know, I only, you know, I only beat up a few people. I only, uh, you know, did a, did this one. You know, it doesn't matter. You have a penalty that has to be paid. And we all know that we're sinners over and over again. The way we treat people, the way we treat ourselves, the things that we've done in our lifetimes, none of us are innocent. But yet Jesus took our place on the cross. He took the penalty for us. And thankfully he did that. And so I stand behind him on judgment day because I believe that, that he did that for me and that I can actually be free of the sins and worthy to stand before the Father in heaven because of Jesus, because of what he did, not because of anything that I can do. And as long as I'm on this earth, I'm going to be a sinner. I'm going to stumble. But again, the goal, I think the goal for every Christian is to, is to practice. And I love that, that idea of we're practicing here for our eternal home. And you don't practice if you're a, if you're a, I, you know, I used to play softball and, and stuff. I, you, if you're a softball player, you don't practice ping pong to become a good softball player. You practice softball. So as a Christian, um, you don't, you don't just practice any spirituality to get to heaven. You practice what the Bible teaches because that's God's word and heaven is his home. Heaven is Jesus home. And he's the only one that's going to open the door and let us in. So we need to know him and we get to know him through study of his word, through a relationship and prayer with him, just talking to him, getting to know him and giving ourselves to him. Um, okay. So I think that that's critical to everyone to understand. That's the salvational issue. This is stuff that as Christians, once you become a Christian, you want to mature in your knowledge. And these are things that people ask questions about all the time. I did before I became a Christian, I had these questions. And it, I think it's important for Christians to have answers or to be able to at least discuss where the, you know, where the theories lie, where the science comes in, where are some of the problems? How, how can we support the biblical narrative with science today? And I think it's, it's very easy to do. And so Getting, getting off my soapbox there a little bit. Let's get into some of these topics. And so again, just backing up a second and that the, the Bible study, the things that you're doing in God's word are most important. This is secondary, but again, I think it's, it's something that we need to be aware of and be able to answer um, when people ask. And so um, the problems with the secular dating method, you know, people don't understand. People say, well, you know, the earth's been dated, the universe has been dated. Um, these rocks have been dated, the fossils have been dated, and um, but none of us really, unless we're a geologist, understand what that means when they've dated things. And so I think um, understanding where there are some problems, um, admittedly, by secular science that there are some problems with some of these dating methods. And we'll we'll look at that diagram again in just a few minutes. But let's step back and say, well, what does the Bible tell us? Um, what does the Bible tell us about the age of the earth? Why is it that there's some Christians that want, want to date the earth as a very young earth, 6,000 to 10,000 years old, maybe something in that, in that area? Well, first of all, we, it's the genealogies that we look at to get a young earth dating. And the genealogies are the number one reason they're in the Bible is to give us a lineage and evidence for Jesus as the promised Messiah. But if you take all the genealogies, which are really spelled out, particularly chapter five and chapter 10, um, when we start in Genesis, there's some things that are really spelled out there in terms of ages of life, when children were born. Um, and you can, as a math, 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 mathematician, maybe, I don't know, I'm not that great at math, but when I look at the numbers and I've seen how 
um, scholars have put together these numbers according to the ages and when people were born. And then you can kind of play that out through the Old Testament as you get to Jesus. And if you didn't know it, there is a, a line in Luke chapter three that gives us his genealogy all the way back to Adam. And I think some of the arguments come in there is where they say, you know, that, but that's not everybody in the line. They skipped some people. Um, maybe those are generational kind of, you know, like overview of the father, meaning maybe, you know, a few, few generations down the line. So even if you were to give into that thought, um, you really are not going to come at much difference, you know, much of a difference in numbers. And that's why I say six to 10,000 years, if you want to give some of those maybe gaps or skipping of people's names, but you're not going to get millions. You're not going to get millions of years. And so, and that becomes a problem when we're looking at the difference between, you know, thousands of years versus millions and even billions of years. And what happens is they keep pushing those numbers even farther back to match up to the evolutionary um, theory. So, um, Again, adding them together results in thousands of years since creation, not millions. And that's that's basically what the Bible teaches. Is it's hard to get around that. Yom is, is a word that is debated sometimes, the Hebrew word for day. And it's used 2,301 times in the Bible. When used in conjunction with other numbers, it always refers to a literal 24-hour day a literal 24 hour day. The only time it is questioned is in that Genesis one account where some people, uh, Christians, I should say, want to reference those six days as, you know, long periods of time or ages or whatever. Um, but because it, speaking about in the original language where how it's used in the Bible is what we should do as Christians is always interpret the Bible by the Bible. Um, there's nowhere to find that in the Bible uh, when it follows that particular rule of the Hebrew literature. So it's really hard to see it. And there's other arguments that we went over before about that um, in terms of the biblical record and what it says in the original language. So the other thing is the fossil record. The fossil record itself the fossils are the dead things. We talked about we talked about those two classes back and the dead things that are buried in the layers that are laid down by the flood, not over millions of years, but very quickly over a short period of time. But the fossil record reveals when you pull those fossils out, you see death, disease, bloodshed, and suffering. Now, if any of that happened before the fall, before humans came on the scene, then God's creation was not good, as God said during the creation week. You know, everywhere along his creation, he says, and it was good and it was very good. And then man, humans come along, you know, and it was very good. The only time he said it wasn't good is when there wasn't a helper for the man and the woman um, was made from the man. And so then it was good because he was complete. So a lot of that, you know, theologically speaking, you know, is very early on in Genesis, we see that. And so if you're looking at it being millions of years in between, you've got then a problem with death, disease and bloodshed and suffering prior to the fall. And, and that's a problem, biblically speaking. God's covenant promise would be nullified if death occurred prior to the fall. There would be no meaning to Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. Therefore, millions of years of death could not have occurred prior to the fall. I think that's a big one as a Christian looking at the covenants and looking at the theology of God's promises. Now, in secular science, again, we've talked about the paradigms. Are there a bias? Is there a bias? Are there assumptions? Are there presuppositions that people hold as they do their science? And so there's some questions that need to be answered by secular evolutionists, particularly geologists in this field, um, about the dating methods. And first of all, I, it, the question could be, I mean, I just put these in question forms. Are the current dating methods based on the presupposition, a priori um, assumption, based on a Darwinian evolutionary paradigm using some assumptions about things in the past that cannot be proven by direct observational science? In other words, the scientific method. Yes, they're based on a paradigm. They're based on things that they are um, saying happened in the past that nobody can observe. We don't, we cannot use the scientific method on the dating 
on the dating of the things of the earth. And, and we'll see why in a few minutes. Do current dating methods work off evolution's uniformitarian paradigm? And that's the belief that processes observed today are basically the same as they have been since the beginning of time. And that's a yes. They're based on a uniformitarian paradigm. And so um, it, it's kind of like the idea that, and I don't know if this is a good example. I've used this a couple of times, but let's just say um, you left your house in the morning, you come back in the afternoon and your house is flooded, just completely flooded. Um, and you walk in, you try and make your way through the mess and the debris and you see your kitchen faucet dripping, dripping very slowly. Now on the uniformitarian paradigm, if we think about that in terms of say, for example, the, the Colorado River cutting through the Grand Canyon, you're looking at something that you observe at that moment. And you're making an assumption that that dripping faucet is dripping at a certain speed. Therefore, it's been dripping at that speed. So this flood in my house has actually taken, and you can do some measurements at the speed of the drip, it would have taken a few weeks to a few months to have caused this kind of flood damage. However, because of observational scientific method kind of thing, you can say, I saw it in the morning, there was no flood, I'm back in the evening, the house is flooded, therefore, I can, I can uh, make a prediction, an assumption, based on observational evidence that in the morning, the faucet wasn't dripping. In the afternoon, it's dripping. Therefore, somewhere in between, it had to be flowing at full force. You kind of see where I'm going with that? So in a short period of time, all this water damage. And so I think therein is the argument again with creationists, young earth creationists and secular evolutionists is that you're looking at the same evidence. You've walked into the same evidence, the scene of the flood. But you're making assumptions based on a dripping faucet that nobody was there in the morning to see. Okay, and that's the difference here. No one saw when the faucet started dripping. Was there a period of time that it was just exploding and then it slowly, it slowed down over time or quickly? I mean, we don't know. We don't know because no one saw it, unlike the faucet dripping that I gave an example. So that's a huge problem. Is there an assumption that the decay rates remain constant, even though they could have been slower or faster in the past? And what we're, gonna, what we're talking about with decay rates has to do with the type of measurements that are be, being taken. And I'll explain that in a minute. Do current dating methods for the rock layers and the fossils found therein reference the man-made geological column of millions and billions of years without actually testing and comparing all existing sites? Again, the answer is yes. There's a lot of assumptions made using that geological column of time. And so really this verifies that there's a philosophical problem, not a scientific problem with dating and the geological layers of the earth. And so what are these da dating methods and why are they unreliable for a difference between thousands and millions of years? So one of the things um, that you wanna note is that radiometric dating is, is what is used to date rocks, so to speak. Radiometric dating methods have about 50 different combinations of elements employed for radioisotope dating that scientists use on igneous rock. Igneous rock um, or magmatic rock is one of the three main rock types, just so you know. The others are sed sedimentary and metamorphic igneous rock. Um, Igneous rock is formed through the cooling and solidification of the magma or lava. So, you know, when it's being formed through the processes of the earth's, you know, erupting volcanoes and things, forming the rocks that we see, and eventually that change over, over time as well. So radiometric dating methods, there's about 50 different ways of doing it, different isotopes that can be used. Um, the radioactive material being measured is considered to be the parent element. So I'll try to do a real simple um, kind of chemistry review here. And so it's, it's considered to be the element and as it decays, it produces what is referred to as the daughter element. So remember I said the assumption is like there's decay rates, you know, that are they assuming that the decay rates are just dripping like the faucet always the same over time or were they faster 
you know, in the past than they are right now. That's a problem. So for example, we're going to use potassium argon. This is a popular dating uh, method. So the parent ele element potassium 40 decays into the daughter material argon 40. Okay. We can scientifically, scientifically measure the amounts of both the parent. So we can measure how much potassium is in the rock and the daughter element, how much argon's in the in a particular rock, and then make an inference, like a guess, as to the amount of decay that's occurred in between. Now, has that decay time taken thousands or millions of years? That's the question, or even billions. But this is where the science stops and the philosophical assumptions begin. And that's where the problem is. So we know the science, we understand that potassium decays into argon, and over a period of time, we can measure the difference between that, you know, potassium amount and the argon amount and say, now we can maybe make an assumption. And again, it's an assumption on the amount of time. So measuring the amount of decay is not, and here is the problem, it is not a measurement of time. We're just measuring the decay because of these following things. And this is this would be the same for any of the 50 radioisotopic um, types of measurements. So the unobserved assumption is made that the melting process, which occurred when the rock formed, started the radiometric clock. So the rock forms out of the volcanic lava explosion kind of thing. And did that start the actual time clock? That's an assumption that's made. Um, we don't know because we weren't there in the beginning, right? But we'll see that we can actually look at some things that can give us a better answer. Um, it is assumed that none of the daughter material was in the rock when it was formed. So that, that rock is formed. And the assumption, again, notice how many assumptions have to be here. There was no daughter material in the rock when it was formed. That's the assumption. If the daughter element was in the rock from the start, the dating will automatically give millions or billions of years older than what the rock really is. So how do they know that there was not the daughter element already there? They don't. Amounts of both the parent and daughter materials can be added to or lost from a rock due to, so these are some reasons why we have problems here. There can be contamination of that rock over time, and this can easily be caused by heat, pressure, moisture, earthquakes, and other forms of contact by other substances that may or may not have materials that can affect that decay. So they cannot guarantee when they're, when they're doing a test on a particular rock, you know, or even fossil, that what they're measuring is correct because of these problems with the assumptions. And were things originally there? Were they added to over time? Was there contamination? They don't know. It is assumed that all decay rates observed today for the various parent elements have always been the same. Again, there's that uniformitarianism, the dripping faucet. It's always been dripping. Or was there a time when that decay rate occurred or even was already there to begin with? To blindly assume that a rock has existed for millions and billions of years and yet has never been contaminated by anything is anything but scientific. It's, it's not scientific. You can't not make you cannot make that assumption. And so this this little chart just just kind of gives you some of the ideas about these assumptions. They're assuming that the granite rock there in that top picture has all the uranium, which later is going to change into the daughter element. So, you know, the problem is they don't know if the granite rock in the beginning had only only uranium or whatever we're looking at. Um, which is, you know, the daughter element being lead. I mean, there's, again, there's the the, the potassium argon one, there's a uranium lead. It, it, there's a whole bunch of them, but they all have the same problem. And so when scientists date rocks, they don't actually observe the atoms changing. They measure the products of the change, which they assume took place in the past. Again, always look for that word assumption. And is it based on something that you can match it with observably? And so they automatically assume how many unstable parent atoms um, existed at the beginning based on how many parent and daughter atoms are left. Second assumption, the rate of change was constant. Scientists assume the radioactive atoms have changed at the same rate throughout time. 
ignoring the impact of creation or changes that could have happened even during Noah's flood. And thirdly, the daughter atoms were all produced by radioactive decay. That's an assumption. Scientists assume that no outside forces, such as, like I said, groundwater or contamination or anything else, have affected it. So this has been a problem, yet creationists have tried to address it. Creation scientists have done their own experiments. And one of the one of the most important things, unfortunate important, important things that happened last century was that in 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted up in Washington State. And because of that significant eruption, scientists have been able to go in and do observational experiments. And some of the things you're not going to hear about because it didn't match the paradigm in place of millions and billions of years. And one of those things has to do with the dating of rock. And again, you can go to, and I give resources, you know, icr.com, uh, ICR Institute for Creation Research. Um, Creation.com has, has a lot of scientists um, that work on these things. And I gave, I gave a list of others as well. Um, but one of the things that they found in 1986, you know, six years after, um, they were taking some samples and they began, you know, to do some tests on them. And they used the potassium argon model um, for the ages of the rocks that they knew were no more than 10 years old. And so over, you know, from 86 to, and they're still doing tests today um, on a lot of this stuff. And again, like I said, you're not going to hear about it because it doesn't support the paradigm that's in place in academia today. And so what happened is though, they did some potassium argon models and they took a whole rock and they used the potassium argon and they dated it at 0.35 million years old, knowing that it was no more than 10 years old. That's a problem. Feldspar, 0.34 million years old. Amphiboly, 0.9 million years old. Pyroxene, 1.7 million years old. Look at all these different datings that were on these different ways, of, uh, different methods, different rocks and things from the same location. Pyroxene concentrate, 2.8 million years old. So these estimates are at a plus or minus um, 0.2 to 0.6 million years old. And they usually say that too with uh, secular dating methods. So again, the problem and the conclusion that can be made here is that there was already argon in those rocks upon their creation. They were created from the lava, from the eruption, and they had inherited excess argon already in them. Therefore, it affected these dates, as you can see. Now, this is an observational test using the scientific method. Again, you can go to, I think it's ICR that has these um, reports, and they were they were published, but again, not, not often used in academia. And Steve Austin um, would be one of the scientists that you might want to look up that's been involved, and he did a dissertation on uh, Mount St. Helens. So this and that information actually comes from his study. So if you want to, if you're wanting to fact check me, look up Steve Austin's dissertation on Mount St. Helens um, dating of their rocks. Now here's the problem: there's three crucial observations that must be made for proper dating to occur. And, or, you know, these, these observations, these questions must be answered. So you have to be able to know how much is in the rock when it was originally created, the daughter element, you know, how much of that was already there. That's, you can't answer that question if you weren't there when it was created. How much contamination is observed by water, plants, chemical runoff, or whatever. Again, impossible to find out if you're not there, if you're not there at the site when it was created. Is the rate of decay consistent over time? Again, these are all unknown because they, they can't actually be done because in most cases, no one was there when it first formed. But again, when we have opportunity to study volcanic eruptions and things like this, then we can do some of these tests and we could say, hey, look, there's a problem. Um, there, there was, and I don't have this in my notes, but I, I think it's the helium um, dating test that actually will give um, because and I should have added in here, but I didn't. So if you want to look it up, if you want to go deeper, the helium um, 
dating test actually gives thousands of years consistently when it's used in dating um, different samples. Again, does it meet the paradigm so they won't use it in secular science? But look up helium um, dating if you want to go there and see how it supports actually um, thousands of years, not millions. So a, a, a few other things that we can say, other examples um, in terms of these dating of things. And this one is going to lead into the problems we see in the geological column of time. And that is the Cambrian uh, layer. Well, you know, if you look at the column, and I'll show you and again in a minute, there's different layers that are considered to be different eras of time, millions and millions of years apart. And the Cambrian layer is one of the lowest layers on the geological column. It's the lowest strata layer that's containing appreciable amounts of fossils, you know, things that have died. Remember, fossils can only be formed quickly. So you always have to ask that question, how did these fossils form in this layer? It had to be something catastrophic and quick. And that contradicts, again, um, the evolutionary theory of millions of years. Um, the secular geologist claim is about 570 million years old in things in the Cambrian layer. Still, but they still contain measurable amounts of carbon, carbon-14. Carbon-14 should be gone after thousands of years, not millions of years. Yet, we find it in this lowest layer. This means that the Cambrian layer is only thousands of years old, not millions. Again, not advertised in secular geology. Even more astounding is that scientific tests have found that all of the strata layers, so up and down the column, the layers that are supposedly millions of years apart, contain basically the same amounts of carbon-14 all the way from the top to the bottom. Now, how do they answer that? I'm not really sure that they can. I think that they'll make excuses about contamination, which they won't use in their own theories. Um, but how do you account for carbon-14 everywhere when it only... Um, only lasts thousands of years as it decays. Since carbon-14 decays away over time, this discovery indicates that all these layers formed, and I think this is really important, formed relatively at the same time during the same event. Hmm, like a, like a global flood maybe? And so going into then this topic of the geological column, so pause for a minute and say, all right, so there's some problems with the dating methods. Now, the arguments can be that, they I mean, it's so far apart that there's problems. Um, the arguments can be that they they throw things out that, you know, they want to have as dates and they they put things in the texts and in their research reports that, that stay with this idea of an old earth in millions of years. And what happens is they have to try to match it up with this geological column of time. And it's also known as the biostratic graph biostratic graphic column, biostratic graphic column, hard to say. So again, if you look, you know, you can kind of see these layers, you see the Cambrian down there is the kind of the last blue layer um, down there. It's about, it, about 570 million years old as science, secular scientists would date it. And so they'll say the fossils they're in um, contain extinct uh, animals and things that are dated at, and then they date because that's supposedly 570 million years old, they'll date those fossils at that age. There's some circular reasoning that goes on here. If the rocks are dated at that age, then the fossils must be that age. And then if they find a fossil, they say it fits that particular column, then it has to be from that era, even though it might be found somewhere else. And that's a problem. Here's the other problem is that a, a lot of those fossils that are supposedly extinct today, they have carbon-14 in them. And a lot of those fossils that they say are extinct, strangely enough, resemble some, some of the living things that are out there today, only we call them by a different name. Um, Dr. Warner, and I'll give some of these references on, um, on the website um, for you to look up if you want to go a little deeper. But Dr. Warner, I can't think of his first name, him and his wife, um, they decided to, to kind of do a, a worldwide search of fossils. And he actually stepped down from his, um, I believe he's a medical doctor, and stepped down from his position to travel with his wife and examine fossils worldwide. And some of the things that they found over about a 14 year period of time was really amazing. Um, and so, you know, if you want to look him up, 
I think it's called the grant. Yeah, it's called the grand experiment. I can't remember his first name. Last name's Warner. Um, look him up and you can see what he found. But one of the things in particular that stood out to me was that he would find um, things that are living today with the same body plan, um, you know, same design of the body. And it's called one thing. And then supposedly there's an extinct species that looks exactly like that one, only it's called by a different name. And that's a problem. If it's still alive today, it's not really extinct. But the name is different, so therefore they say it's a different species. Problem with that. And he's he's uncovered a lot of that kind of thing. So his stuff, his work is really interesting. Um, again, look him up. And I'll try to and I'll try to remember to put the reference on the website for you as well. Okay. Well, here's another problem is here's the geologic column matched up with the Grand Canyon. And the problem with the geologic column is that this was an invented column. And nowhere on earth do we find all those layers together in any place. Like the Grand Canyon is missing millions and millions of years because some of those layers, they don't exist in the Grand Canyon. Um, nowhere on earth has anyone found, to my knowledge, all of those layers in one location. So there's a problem there as well. And so, you know, he, here is how the rocks and fossils are actually dated by the secular geologists. Geologists use the geologic time scale, also known as the geologic column, which is a drawing consisting of 12 primary layers, each being given a name, an ancient age, and assigned fossils. These are plants and animals assumed to have gone extinct in the column's particular assigned time period, especially when you get you know down into some of those lower layers. We've all heard of the Jurassic right era where most of the dinosaurs are said to be found, but they're not always all in that layer, which is a problem. Um, and so what is the history of this a little bit? Well, this goes back to, let's just look at that briefly. Charles Lyell popularized the column, the drawing in his book, The Principles of Geology, published in 1830. This time scale or column is based on the philosophy of uniformitarianism which is things are the way they have always been. No flood or other catastrophic events have ever occurred. And again, this is way back in 1830 before a lot of archeology span and other things have shown what they do show today. And the theory that the layers were laid down slowly over long periods of time, this was popularized by Charles Lyell. All right, and then we have, um, okay, we'll just, let me give you a little more information here. So. Published radiometric dates, again, are selected once an age is obtained that matches the geologic column. So this goes to that assumption and presuppositions in the paradigm. There's a paradigm in place. So when they're finding things such as fossils or rocks and they're trying to date them, they need to match up this geologic column. And so oh, they, they date them. If they don't get a right date, they do it over again until a date is obtained that best matches the column. Non-matching dates are tossed out. Again, you can fact check that with other information, but it that's what happens. Whenever index fossils are found in a particular layer, everything in that layer is given the age that matches the column where they have been assigned. And consequently, if a rock or layer contains an index fossil, the rock or layer is assigned the age the fossil is dated based on the column. So if that sounds a little like circular reasoning, the rocks da dated based on the fossil, the fossils dated based on the rock and how they match that column, there's a problem there, I think. So keep in mind that it's assumed by the mainstream science community that there was never a worldwide flood that laid down the rocks and strata layers quickly that formed these fossils in those layers and that God had nothing to do with this. We'll keep that in mind. Also remember that fossils can only form by rapid burial, encasement, or by freezing. Dead things will be eaten by scavengers or decompose fairly quickly when out of the elements. So, you know, how did we get all these fossils in these layers would be my question. And I don't think it's a slow process over millions of years that laid down these layers. And if you didn't see any of the previous presentations that we went over or is Genesis history, go back and view those. Because, you know, I'm sure there might be some questions coming up that um, we've already covered. And so I'm assuming that you've, you've been with us as we work through this. All of session six, you want to make sure you've gone through in order to kind of put this all together. 
So again, we see this as circular reasoning at its finest. The ages of the rock layers are derived from the index fossils found within them, while the ages of the index fossils are obtained from which the which rock layer they are found in. So the geologic columns time scale is where modern day old earth beliefs were de derived. So the idea that the earth is very, very old comes from this concept that I just tried to present right here. And so I hope that makes sense. Um, and again, the problem is it's all philosophical because there are assumptions and we have to ask the question, where can we observe the geological column in nature? And the answer is we cannot. It only exists in museums and textbooks. So again, the, the picture that I've shown you of the column, the columns on the left there, on the right, again, uh, the Grand Canyon and any other place around the world, none of them have all of these layers. These are assumed layers of time. So I, I hope that makes, makes sense. Now, I'm going to wrap up with that kind of final question people are going to ask. What about the dinosaurs? What about the dinosaurs? You know, and the dinosaurs are said to be in that Jurassic layer there, although they're not always found in that layer, found in other places. There's a lot of things about dinosaurs um, that are up for question that, again, if it doesn't fit the secular paradigm that's taught in secular public education, these things are thrown out. But but there's a lot of facts. And so I think dinosaurs are very interesting. I'm going to give an overview and then, again, references for you to go a little deeper if you want on some of these things with the dinosaurs. Um, but, you know, again, dinosaurs are said to be a Jurassic era. Dinosaurs were said to have died out some 60 million years ago um, with an asteroid that hit the Earth. And, and there's a whole story that goes into that. Again, when you start to look at the evidence, and I presented some two weeks ago, it doesn't it doesn't match up with that particular um, theory. And so let's let's look at a few things again. So what about the dinosaurs? So again, the fossil record from its earliest specimens do not show change over time. Instead, we find most of the species we have today, with the exception of those that have gone extinct, including dinosaurs. And there are no transitional missing links. So the, the things that we're finding, and again, as time has gone on from Darwin and Lyle and all these guys to today, their expectation was we were going to find all these supposed missing links, you know, that are transitional over time. But we haven't found those. We haven't found those. And so that's important to keep in mind. The word dinosaur itself means terrible lizard terrible lizard. That's the meaning of that word. Now, it's important to note that the word dinosaur did not exist until it was coined in 1840. Prior to that time, words like dragon were used. And we'll look at some other words that are used in the Bible as well. And so, you know, what do we consider to be dinosaurs? Most dinosaurs fall into the reptile category. Dinosaurs are in the beast category when we talk about days of creation. So they were created on day six. Dinosaur fossils were first discovered around 1822, and as I said, the name was coined in 1840. Archaeology and paleontology are still young sciences. Even, even today, they're considered young sciences, but they make some pr mature predictions. And according to ICR's Dr. Kurt Weiss, dinosaur fossils are found in the strata along with other pre-flood plants and animals. Therefore, they would have been among the kind brought onto the ark. And we talked about that as well when we talked about the ark's capacity in our first session, part one. Um, part, session six, part one, we talked about that. Dinosaur fossils with soft tissue, including DNA, have been found in modern times today. Soft tissue cannot last millions of years. There's an article called uh, 101 Questions about dinosaurs by Philip Curry and Eva uh, Koppelhaas, I think it is. Um, you can look that up. It's a peer reviewed in Science Deep. It's in the Journal of Creation. And it'll give you a lot of really good information about dinosaurs and, you know, in terms of when they existed and what evidence we can actually see and look at. So what does the Bible have to say? The biblical account, you know, again, God created all land animals on day six. 
And so in the book of Job, which is considered to be you know, one of the oldest books in the Bible, we read in several different places about these large creatures. And God is speaking when he says, and he's speaking to Job here. And he says, behold, now behemoth he uses the word behemoth, which I made as well as you. Sixth day, right? He eats grass like an ox. Now, again, listen to the description. Because it's a lot like what's in that picture there. Behold, now his strength is in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. Now, some people want to say, um, well, you know, that he's talking about an elephant or hippopotamus or something like that. But again, look at the description. The description fits very neatly with what you see in the picture there. Like, a, like I think I would call that like a brontosaurus or a stegosaurus or one of those right but those descriptions there very much like what we know to be uh dinosaurs leviathan this is also from job um leviathan his strong scales are his pride shut up as with a tight seal one is so near to another that no air can come between them so it's about like scales there they are joined one another to one another they clasp each other and cannot be separated his sneezes flash forth light hmm. and his eyes are like the the eyelids of the morning out of his mouth go burning torches sparks of fire leap forth out of his nostrils smoke goes forth as from a boiling pot and burning rushes his breath kindles coals as a flame goes forth from his mouth in his neck lodges strength and dismay leaps before him the folds of his flesh are joined together firmly on him and immovable it's a really interesting description now there are, is evidence of very large creatures in both water and land. We do have today creatures also that can do some of these things that we think of as being a little far-fetched, but like the smoke, the breathing, fire-breathing dragon, we think of those as being mythological. But yet there are creatures we can see today, like fireflies that emit light. We have luminescent jellyfish. We have these bombardier beetles that emit a chemical that looks like fire little beetles. Um, we have bugs with lights on their tails. We have eel monsters and, and kimono, uh, kimono dragons that actually spit like kind of stuff that burns you, you know. Um, it has been suggested by some experts even about dragons existing because we, we, all, we also have this language not just in the Bible, but we have it in medieval literature as well. You know, how the knights that fought dragons, we have uh, even Marco Polo, I think it was, that um, uh, has was fought a dragon. I mean, where do these things come from? But it's been suggested by some experts that dragons could have had, and this is a possibility, methane from their bellies, like a burp, and along with friction in their throats, could produce a folk, smoke or fire-like emittance and a toxic chemical. Um, that's been proposed as being a possibility because we do see it in smaller creatures, like some of those bugs. Tannanim is another word. It's a Hebrew word that's used 27 times in the Old Testament to indicate sea monster or monster. Comparative linguistics also show that this word can be translated or is translating as dragon, monster, and snake that stretches out moving forward like smoke. So these are interesting linguistics um, on the word. The Septuagint also translates the word as dragon or monster. Again, remember, dinosaur was is a fairly new term. Dinosaur evidence from the pre-flood era. Pre-flood era. So God created all land animals on the sixth day. Dinosaur fossils are found with other pre-flood plants and animals. God said he would destroy all living things that walked on the earth, except for the two of each kind that were on the ark. So um, I think it's important to remember a couple things about that. Let's just stop and think. Remember the biblical description of the earth and climate before the flood. Long lifespans. Before the flood, the human race was genetically pure. So were all the animals. No disease, mutations in the cell, none of that. No rain had fallen on the earth. And the, you know, the expanse of water above the earth could keep out the harmful cosmic rays. It shielded people and animals from environmental factors we have today. And, and right after the flood. Things change. You begin to see that as you read. God gave people long lives so they had time to fill the earth. Here's the thing. 
many reptiles, we know this today, many reptiles will continue to grow until they die. So if dinosaurs and, you know, other animals lived hundreds of years, they would have been enormous. You know, we've, we've found, scientists have found 60 foot algae found at the North Pole. I mean, stuff like that, asparagus shoots that are just huge, you know, after the flood, lifespans declined. And it would be, I think, the same to see that dinosaurs were not able to survive at those large sizes post flood, but they were around. If there was a worldwide flood, then we would expect to find dead things buried rapidly in water laid sediments all over the earth. So this fossil formation where we find the dinosaurs and what do we find? Dead things buried rapidly in water laid sediments all over the earth, including the dinosaurs all over the earth. Now, what about dinosaur evidence in the post-flood era? So if they were on the ark, they would have multiplied and survived post-flood. Lifespans did decrease for humans after the flood. Took, took some time, but they decreased. I would assume that would be the same for the animals. So think about that. And some things we can consider as we can observe today, reptiles still exist today at a smaller scale. They will continue to grow as they age, but they do not live as long as they did in the pre-flood world. Um, multiple cre uh, cultures, again, multiple cultures around the world report dinosaur accounts in their history, their literature, and their art. Um, they use words like dragon, monster, snake, beast, all over the place. Some species have gone extinct due to loss of food supply, post-flood especially. The environmental conditions change, like the Ice Age happened after the flood and man's invasion of their land and habitat. There is physical and eyewitness evidence of dinosaurs coexisting with man in the recent past throughout the world. And there's quite a few things, and I don't have time to get into all those evidences, um, but I would say uh, just a couple quick things, um, and I'll give you another reference, Brian Thomas, ICR, again, another guy who wrote, he has Guide to Dinosaurs, Five Clues that Dinosaurs Existed with Humans. Um, and a few, just a few notes that I have here. There's clever, unique designs found in fossils and art. Um, one in particular, I know they found like down in Mexico where they found some pottery and they had these pictures of dinosaurs with these weird kind of spots on them. And, you know, it was just thought that the, the people who drew them and made the pottery and stuff just kind of imagined what it would look like. But then they found fossilized dinosaurs in that area that had we strange, weird, spotty skins that were preserved in the fossil rock that match that pottery. So that tells you that the people that drew on that pottery had a visual of those dinosaurs. So I think that's really interesting. Um, so we've got clever, unique design found in fossils and on the art together. Um, catastrophic death, you know, again, in the poses in the, in the flood, we saw that of the ones that were existing pre-flood. We've got many, many different accounts of, of like clashes with dra uh, dragons in human history. And again, let me see, um, a couple other references I'll try to give. Let's see, uh, Kent Hoven in Ray Comfort Science, Scientific Facts in the Bible. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff written there. You know, and I'll just, I don't know what I do without trying to just go through these notes I have is just, I'll put up the references. So if you want to look at some of those, you can go there and take a look at a little bit deeper examples. Now, if that's not enough for you, what I just am going to end with is a few more questions that need to be answered about the age of the earth. So if the universe and the earth itself was billions of years old, and I would just throw these out because these are, I've never heard the secular um, science world be able to answer the whys on these. Why are galaxy spirals not tightly coiled as they should be if they're millions and billions of years old? Um, and without going into a lot of detail here, I'm just going to read through these. But these are questions that are should be's if they're if the Earth and the universe is billions of years old. These are should be's and they're not. So why are galaxy spirals not tightly coiled as they should be? Why are supernovas and comet ages young when they should be old? Why has the birth of a new star never been observed? Why is the moon not farther away? 
if it is moving out at a constant rate, they have it measured at, like, I think it's like four centimeters every year, a few years or something. So again, if you rewind that, the moon would have been way too close for it to even, and then you get into gravitational issues and everything else that the earth wouldn't even be habitable at that point. So again, I, wanna, I don't want to go deep into these, but these are questions you can explore if you want to go a little deeper. Why is there not enough mud on the seafloor? These are things that should be of millions of years. Why does the amount of salt in the sea not match the secular time scale? The sea should be way too salty um, than what we have today in the regular oceans. Why is there too much helium in minerals? Remember I talked about um, helium being one of those dating methods that they don't use because it gives thousands of years, not, not millions and billions. Why are there not enough Stone Age skeletons? Why is agriculture so recent? Why is human history so short? Human history as it's recorded at all anywhere, it comes pretty close to matching what the Bible has in recorded time. And why does the predicted human population rate, growth rate, not match the secular time scale, but instead matches perfectly with the biblical time scale? So, and there's a, there's a little graph here, but you know, we should we should actually be like 10, 10 billion at by, you know. 21,000. I don't know. It doesn't match up where we should be if humans have been around for billions or millions of years is what I believe the talk is. They've adjusted that over the time over time. And now it's like 100 to 200,000 years, but then they keep moving those numbers around. Um, but it doesn't match. The population growth should be way off the chart if that were true. And again, these are things you can look into. Why do earthquake ret records match biblical records? Why does the geologic column not contain the proper order of index um, fossils according to their own scale? Why is soft tissue found in fossils that are considered to be millions of years old? That's a big one. And why are we still here if the electromagnetic force has been growing weaker over time? I have a, a few recommendations here on going. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I had a couple more here. Why are we still here if the sun has been losing its mass at a constant rate? Again, you could do math with that and think like we should already be gone. Since humans have been able to alter the speed of light, why can't the creator of all things do it as well? So those are some things just to ponder and if you want to look into them. Um, again, recommendations, if you want to go deeper, a, a book that was done quite a few years back by John Wickham and Henry Morris, The Flood, is really comprehensive and deep on all of these things. The Cost by Russ Miller is an easy read. I highly recommend that one. Faith, Form, and Time, What the Bible Teaches and Science Confirms About Creation and the Age of the Universe. That's Kurt Wise. Really, really good. The Deep Time uh, Deception. Um, that's Michael J. Ord. And I also recommended his documentary on the receding waters. Really good stuff. And then there's that article I mentioned um, just a little while, while ago, um, 101 Questions About Dinosaurs, if you want to check that out. That's peer-reviewed in Science Deep. And so um, we're going to stop there. And I'm going to uh, highly encourage you to keep doing the Bible study. This week, you would be on Genesis chapter 10. There's the questions. I also have them on the website. Again, go to the website, truthfaithandreason.com. If you have uh, comments that you want to make, questions you want to ask, you can do that there. Um, and again, I'm encouraging you as, a, as small groups or as individuals, if you can't come to our in-person class that you're doing this Bible study um, on your own regularly, because again, what I'm doing is giving what I hope is answers to help you with those, those big questions that get asked as you're doing Bible studies and as you're going through some of these things, you can, you can have them in your back pocket and you can discuss and talk about them um, as well. And so we'll go ahead and stop there and we'll come back um, next week with what might be the last one in this class um, series before starting our next one. But what we're doing is following the Genesis outline. And so, you know, basically wrapping up um, the flood this week and then looking a little bit at what Genesis chapters 10 and 11 have to say about um, after the flood and moving into uh, a very important person in the history of, of Christianity and, and Judaism as well, of course, would be Abraham. And we'll, we'll begin to talk about him a little bit too. So I hope you um, will stay with us. Thank you for being here. Have a very um, blessed week and we'll see you back next week.
拜拜。